Hello, everyone. Hope you all can hear me. Uh, welcome to the ISQAL's webinar titled Artificial Intelligence, the Intersection of Emerging Technology Beyond GDP. And we'll do a few introductions. Um, first, we have Laura Musikansky, Executive Director of the Happiness Alliance at happycounts.org. John C. Havens, he's the Executive Director of the IEEE Global Initiative for Ethical Considerations in Artificial Intelligence and Autonomous Systems, it's quite a title. And my name, of course, is Jill Johnson, uh, Executive Director of ISQALS. Um, with all of that, I will turn it over now to Laura, who will talk a little bit about our webinar. Okay, super. There we go. So it's my great pleasure to um, introduce Esqualls. I'm thinking I'm introducing Esqualls to John C. Havens, who is truly um, an visionary and seeing things that I think most of us aren't seeing what's happening in the future of the human species and in terms of the happiness movement and how that intersects with many other areas. Um, I'm going to tell how I first met John Havens. He sent me an inquiry to do an interview for Mashable's um, series called The Optimism Economy. And in it, he said that what he was doing was fairly geeky. And I, so I said, oh my goodness, <laughs> I love this guy. <laughs> that was in 2012. In 2014, we did a conference, a happiness conference in Burlington, Vermont with GNH USA. It was in four sections and John and I were in charge of the data section and we were like, oh my goodness, nobody's going to want to listen to this. It was right after lunch. Everybody's going to fall asleep. So we decided to do a little sketch called The Wizard of Us. And then I found out that John has a background in, in, uh, in Broadway, that he has been both an actor and a scriptwriter. Oh. And we did. That, we st I still have a script for that. That was fantastic. Cool. So John, John is also <laughs> the author of Heartfelt Intelligence and Hacking Happiness, both published by, um, by Penguin. Um, he's a keynote speaker, so if you go to his, his website, johnchavens.com, um, you'll see some of the work that he's done, and then you can follow him on Twitter. So this is a person to keep an eye on, and I, again, am really very happy to introduce John to Isqual's. Uh, the intent of this webinar is to encourage what John calls cross-pollination between technologies. So you're, you're going to hear about the work that he's doing that is truly cutting edge uh, around artificial intelligence and autonomous systems. And some of the questions that that should be raising sort of in the back of your head, of your mind, and in a sense, sort of making the hair stand up on your neck are questions about what does it mean to be human? What does consciousness mean? And these are the areas that John is tackling and that we are so very honored to be able to present this invitation to you, uh, to people at Esquals and to other people in, in other disciplines to join this work that John is doing called IEEE P7010 Working Group Focused on Wellbeing and Ethical AI. So I'm going to finish be right before I um, hand it over to John with this presentation has lots of links in it. It will be available to you so that you can access these links after this webinar. So without further ado, thank you John, John for joining and I put it on the next slide. Awesome. Well, Laura, thank you for uh, having me and Jill as well. I'm thrilled to be, you know, on the webinar with, uh, for Isquals, and I'm also really excited to be in Innsbruck. It's one of my favorite cities in the world and also just very excited uh, to speak uh, with so many uh, amazing global thought leaders in the realms of well-being and positive psychology. So thank you for the invitation uh, for the webinar and the event. Um, so what I'll do is I'll go through. I know we have like five minutes. I'm going to introduce a lot of stuff at once. Um, enjoy. <laughs> and if you have a question uh, per what Laura said, please follow up with me. If you have questions uh, with Laura, with Jill, or with me, I'm happy to answer them. So um, uh, the, the program that I'm executive director for, Jill read the long name, it's here. Uh, the shortened version is the IEEE Global Initiative for Ethical Artificial Intelligence. And if you're unfamiliar with IEEE, it's the world's largest engineering association, has about a half million members in 160 countries. And formally, our program is under the Standards Association. There's multiple parts of IEEE. So that's where our initiative, the main program sits. Uh, next slide, please, Laura. 
So um, we do two main things in the global initiative. The first thing is we work on this uh, paper that we've created called Ethically Aligned Design. And as you can see, the subtitle in terms of something Isquals would be uh, familiar with, of course, uh, is a vision for prioritizing human well-being with AI and autonomous systems. And the basic idea here is that you can build responsible artificial intelligence in the sense of how can it be safe, how can it be something that honors human agency and emotions, but the key performance indicators once it's released, uh, our view is that it needs to uh, uh, provably, and this is a challenge as, as you all would know in the well-being field, to try to actually uh, improve human well-being as a priority. Uh, I won't have time to talk through this whole slide, but version one of our document came out last December of 2017. And now if you can go to the next slide, uh, version two we're currently working on, it's gonna come out in November or December of this year. And we're excited because we actually have a well-being committee and I'm chair on that committee. Laura is on the, on the committee. And uh, uh, I'll tell you more about the standard that we're creating in a minute. But what's exciting about this document, we want it to be the go-to resource, the long form resource, because it's probably gonna be about 200 pages, that if you're creating artificial intelligence and you're an academic, uh, meaning a, a person actually at a university or you're a technologist, a programmer, an engineer, building AI, we want this to be a great resource for you to say, how are these other, now we have about 250 members, how are they framing the key issues around AI and ethics that I can consider? And we have tons of links to other organizations. We'll add stuff to Isquals for version two, which would, would be great. And, and we don't want to be the only answers. We can't provide all the answers, but we would love to point to all the other great organizations that are doing similar work so that no one goes, okay, I hear that ethics is important, artificial intelligence. What do I do? We want to give you solid answers. You don't have to agree with them, but we want to give you solid direction. Next slide. Um, as I mentioned, the Wellbeing Committee uh, is something Laura and I are part of. Uh, our content will be part of Ethically Aligned Design version two. This is just a quick snapshot of the document as it stands. Next slide. We actually did a program, IEEE, the initiative in the European Parliament last April, where we talked about the intersection of uh, if we were to create technology, not just with GDP metrics, but beyond GDP metrics, specifically AI, how would that be something that could help uh, increase human well-being? And it went very well. You can see our report in the video. It's about seven minutes of the actual event we did, and there were about nine parliamentarians present. It was very exciting. So the, the, the committee document that we're working on, plus the standard I'll tell you about, this is already some of the research that's factoring into both of those places. Next slide. Okay, so um, so from let's see if I understand correctly, John, for people to understand what was being asked and what is happening. IEEE, which is the go-to organization for engineers, will be issuing a set of standards for artificial intelligence and autonomous systems. We're asking here that this be based on interdisciplinary participation. So this. Um, begs one question, which is how do people get involved? And once they do get involved, what will um, what will be the ask? What are they going to be asked to do? The second is how is this going to be used? So um, in the future, if somebody is developing an artificial intelligence system or an autonomous system, how will this would be used? And then the third question is uh, what kind of research questions should academics be thinking about? So those are three, three things that come to mind for me, and um, if you could uh, help us understand a little better, that would be great. Sure, and if I forget any of the questions, let me know. Um, but the first is, so uh, what we're doing with the initiative is, one, we're creating this paper called Ethically Aligned Design. And if people wanna join those committees, like Laura's on the Wellbeing Committee, uh, you get in touch with me, we tell you the 13 committees, and you know, obviously, hopefully you have experience in the different areas you'd like to join and you join the committee, it's free. And the logic there is that we wanna get all the best minds we can to create ethically aligned design the paper. Secondly, like any IEEE Standards Association working group, it takes about two to three years to create a standard. And so you join what's called the standards working group. 
And to join that, you don't have to be an IEEE member. Thank you, the 710 is, is an example of a standards working group. Um, this URL at the bottom, if you want to join this group, which we would love, especially the ISQL's audience and, and membership, uh, you go down to the bottom of this page, that URL, and you can click. It says join the working group. It's, and again, it's free. You don't have to be an IEEE member. It's great if you want to join. It's pretty cheap if you do. Uh, but then that process is you join phone calls about once every six to eight weeks. And um, it's, it's somewhat formal. You know, you read guidelines and, and policies, but then it just turns into an open conversation. But it's a conversation that's directed towards consensus. So what that means is uh, me as chair and actually Laura's going to be vice chair of this group will create an outline and will create a direction based on the scope of what you see here. And the goal is after two or three years to create, it's usually about 100-ish pages standard that will ask to actually list requirements, meaning if you meet these requirements, then you are hitting this standard. Now, how IEEE standards are normally used, you're probably used to something like Wi-Fi, right? Everyone's used to Wi-Fi. You go to any hotel or a conference and you're like, what's the Wi-Fi password, right? Well, the Wi-Fi standard was created by IEEE. So that means however many years ago, I think it was like 20 years ago, a bunch of people got on these same type of phone calls with the Wi-Fi standard. It was like about 300 people in the working group. And they pushed through and said, people want to get online the internet. Are we going to use Bluetooth, Ethernet, whatever? And then the Wi-Fi standard came into being. And that's why when you go anywhere around the world in general, you can get online. With this standard, 710, uh, 7010, um, first of all, it's not law. Okay, so standards aren't law. Sometimes in certain countries that have common law practices, standards can be used as a sort of uh, tool where there isn't law to say, well, look, at least this global, not at least, but there's a global standards organization. That's a term called SDO, Standards Development Organization. IEEE, a respected standards group, has created a standard in this area. And that's great because then the point is, is that it was created by consensus, all these cross-pollinating minds working together as a best case practice thing to use where you don't have laws yet. But it's not uh, the, the reason Laura and I, in terms of the working group, have our work cut out for us, is we have to get a good cross-pollination of people involved in the effort so that people will adopt the standard, right? The logic is you read the standard, you get excited about it, and you feel that you should implement it because it's the best thing to do. Great, thank you. So you wanna talk a little bit about the, um the different areas? Sure, so uh, Laura mentioned, so for P7010, uh, this is sort of five general buckets of what we're gonna try to do. First of all, is success happens if we get a good combination of, of uh, people involved. So not just engineers, not just academics, we need ISQL's experts, right? And it's okay if you have no experience in artificial intelligence, that's great, because the logic is we need the cross-pollination so the well-being experts can teach the AI experts and vice versa. Awareness, a lot of the um, engineering committee, uh, as I'm sure you know in your work with ISQLs, people of course know well-being stuff in general, but a lot of times they think it just means mood and they aren't aware that there's both individual flourishing metrics and societal metrics. So awareness, a lot of this standard we wanna list, what are the top well-being metrics that exist? Just so simply people know that they're there. Uh, relevance is key. You know, once people pick up this standard, it's a 100-page document. The first question we have to answer is, for them, why do I care? And the logic is, if you know you're creating artificial intelligence that can provably not just align with, but improve human well-being, that's already an exciting reason to pick it up. And then if you're a business person, you can say, well, what's the ROI? Why am I doing this? Well, you can save money because you have less risk about hurting people, for instance, when you know that you are improving well-being, et cetera. So relevance is key. Uh, case studies, you know, to get people to really understand what we're talking about, even where certain things don't exist, we're gonna need to list, you know, early success case studies. And this is again, where we'd love people from ISQLs because we need well-being case studies that translate well to the enterprise. And that of course, there's things like the B Corp movement, there's whole sustainability CSR movements, great. What is the place where we can say, in terms of how artificial intelligence technology is already being used, organizations creating it are aware of well-being metrics, whether it's the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals or OECD Better Life Index, awesome. K 
case studies mean that people go, oh, they're doing it, now I see how I can too. And then they operationalize, this is really the AI experts and the programmers come into play, and this is where I think you know, it could be, or hopefully would be very cutting edge, which is say you have a companion robot in someone's house that's designed to understand a person's emotion because it uses what's called affective sensors. That just means the robot knows John is going like this. That means he is either happy, you know, whatever, and they can measure the expression. And the logic is in the programming, start to gather data that can then align with, again, well-being metrics. John in his house exhibiting this behavior matches whatever, um, you know, uh, uh, say a World Health Organization depression metric. And then that means in real time through the cloud, the robot could even have a suggestion that align with uh, behavior recommendations. And this, of course, also implies the owner of the robot has given consent to do this. But the robot might say, smile back. <laughs> and when the robot smiles back, then that could say, when the robot did this action, it improved well-being according to these metrics. So the logic is you can actually program you know, all these different wonderful metrics that exist. One great thing about machine learning is the ability to sift through all of those things and create algorithms about how to try to figure this stuff out. So that's, that's the sort of end goal, which is going to be a real challenge, but we think we're up to it. Beautiful. Beautiful. All right. So I'm going to, we don't have too many people, so I'm going <laughs> to unmute everybody um, and just. That's a, gr that's a great slide, by the way. I think we should all do that face. <laughs> So just to open it up to, to questions from anybody. Anybody have any questions? Well, I'm wondering um, if you could maybe give a specific example of a, an, AI, an AI technology that you feel has the potential to negatively impact human well-being. I mean, that's sort of a general broad question, but I don't know if there's anything on the horizon or that you could think of? Sure, I think, you know, like, like any um, technology, and this is where I want to be careful with your question because I'm going to get to it, but any technology can be either, you know, quote, used for good or evil, big quotes, right? Like a stick, you can stir soup or you can hit somebody with it, <laughs> right? The right. technology. That said, I also say that while technology is neither good nor evil, it's also never inert, right? Meaning a lot of times, it sort of, it leads to decisions. Anyway, um, a, lot of, a lot of our work has to do with data in terms of how a, a machine or a system utilizes a person's data. Part of what we, we, we know can harm well-being is aspects, for instance, of consent, meaning how someone wants their data to be used, that is up to them and their family, right? Like, you may be fine with data being used for advertisers, or you may not. That's not anything we're trying to control, as it were. However, um, what we consider to be harmful to well-being is when there may be data that's accessed without permission, without consent, and then it's used in ways where the person making the technology, AI or otherwise, doesn't intend it to be harmful, like they have good intentions, but because you haven't done the consent or the sort of extra due diligence of what we're recommending, that the person may be harmed. So the logic there is that if you know, well, we're using these well-being metrics to, after we've used consent and after we've given the person the ability to whatever, turn things off or on, right? Meaning more whatever data exchange, then the human well-being metrics that say, well, this person has more well-being, that's validation um, for that AI technology, not just to say where it may be harming someone, but to standardize the metrics of when it helps. Right. I want to add in some other issues that um, that we looked at at the well the last committee, and also the issues that we know are coming on the horizon, including work. Um, you know, there's a wonderful book called Homo Deus that talks about will humans become irrelevant because will, they will no longer be needed for work. So that's a real well-being question, and we know that we have these issues coming with. Um, with climate change and uh, species depletion, maybe even our own ex species extinction, and maybe even our own, um, and and 
Um, and then the, the threats that are coming to us with sea level rise, et cetera. So what is the role of artificial intelligence and autonomous systems in, in, that, in that place? Um, I was recently in Dubai at the World Government Summit where they, they're looking at these issues uh, quite, quite closely. Uh, they're seeing this as, as they're, they're experiencing them now um, and looking at uh, artificial intelligence and autonomous systems as um, as solutions. So I think that this this issue is right on and there's a lot that we need to explore around this um, and that this it would be great for um, Iskwals and others to to be looking at this. So with that we're at um, we're at 20 minutes so um, we want to wrap it up Jill and then um, mm -hmm. we can always stay on for more questions if people have other questions. Okay. I'll go ahead and go to the next slide. So Jill, if you wanted to wrap it up. Sure, thank you, John. That was great. We appreciate you taking the time to share this with us. Um, of course, we wanna remind everyone that we will be sharing these slides. Um, you can join LinkedIn uh, and just that way you'll be able to download the slides on SlideShare. Um, and we'll be also posting this again on our YouTube page. There's that link right there um, to join the group that John was mentioning um, and we will be uh, sending that out at the end of this this webinar. John, did you have anything more to say about that particular group? Uh, no, just if you're interested, like I said, it's free to join. You just send an email and we haven't scheduled our first meeting yet. It'll be in the next month or two okay. and you join by a phone call. So really, we'd love to have you and, uh, you know, you'll, you'll get a better sense. If you join, we'll send, you know, documents to get you prepared for the call. But we really need the minds of the people who are involved in ISQUILS and we'd love to have you. Right. And then Laura, I think the next slide um, reminds everyone about yes. the upcoming yes. conference. <laughs> so hopefully everyone who's joined us here is attending the ISQUILS conference in Innsbruck, which we're all excited about at the end of September. And John, you have a talk at the conference. I do. Excellent. Do you want yep. to say a little bit about that? It's called I Love Innsbruck, because uh, I do. I was, there, I was there years ago uh, in high school and uh, just fell in love with it. I mean, look at that picture of the mountains. It's just like they're hugging you, you know, like it's awesome. Um, I'm, I'm embarrassingly blanking on the title of my talk, but it's very similar um, to what we just talked about, which is really my hope is with this amazing gathering of people you pulled together in Innsbruck is to say, look, um, we need to cross pollinate. We have to get the well being experts and the engineers and the programmers in the same room working towards increasing well being. Because, you know, by the way, of course, in general, uh, all the AI people we're working with, the 250, or not in general, all of them, no one's like, hey, let's kill people. Let's destroy the planet. Like, can't wait to, you know, our, our species is extinct. That's not the goal. But, if you don't know what it means to align to well-being metrics, then either you may build towards exponential growth of GDP, you might build to something else, and this is where uh, that will be really helpful. And then, of course, like you mentioned, Laura, there's so many glorious technologies where the technology being used to increase well-being um, can, can transform the world for good and, and slow down or even stop a lot of the really horrible stuff mm. that is happening. So. That's kind of the basic nutshell of, of the talk is kind of like a, let's get together and work on this stuff together. Excellent. And then we wanna encourage everyone also to read your book, Artificial Intelligence. The final point is to participate and invite others to participate in the IEEE Wellbeing Metric Standards for Ethical Artificial Intelligence and Autonomous Systems, which we've already talked about. Anything else to add, John or Laura? See you in Innsbruck. <laughs> yeah, can't wait to meet you, meet you in Innsbruck, and thank you again for having me. I appreciate it.